Good morning, First Family and guests. Happy Palm Sunday. Easter is next Sunday. Who are you planning to invite? Holy Week starts today. The Monday Thursday service is this Thursday at 7 p.m. and Easter services are at 9.30 and 11. Sunday groups will not meet on Easter. For more information about Easter this year, visit our table in the Welcome Center after both services today. We also need your help with volunteering on Easter. You can serve in many different areas like greeting, taking photos at the Easter cross, or assisting with parking. Go online to sign up today. And ladies, mark your calendars for this year's Made for More Women's Retreat here at FBCA on Friday, April 5th and Saturday, April 6th. Go online or visit the table in the Welcome Center this morning for all the details, including times, registration costs, and what you can expect. And now, welcome to worship. Thank you, children. I used to say the children are the future of the church. But, you know, after I've experienced them leading them worship Sunday after Sunday, I now adjust that to the children are the church. We are so glad to have a healthy children's ministry here. It just blesses us. It's Palm Sunday. It is Palm Sunday. Welcome to worship this morning. You know, I know some of the parents, I, I can think of two or three parents at least, they delayed their spring break vacation so that the children could be here and lead us in worship today. I, I just think that's a wonderful thing. If you are here on vacation, we are so happy that you have chosen to spend time with us on this Palm Sunday morning. I'm going to ask that you all stand up and greet each other, welcome each other to worship as we continue to sing.
My name is Reed Burnick. I am the pastor for Adult Discipleship here at First Baptist, and I just want to welcome you, add my welcome to other welcomes you've received, and thank you for being here. Today is a special day. We're a week from Easter, um, and so there's a lot to think about, but if you're new here, if this is your first time here, or maybe you've been here for six months and you're not really sure if you know anyone but you'd like to, then let me make a suggestion that there's some cards in the pew back in front of you, and I would invite you to make that your offering today. There'll be a time later in the service where plates will be passed, and members among us and uh, those who are part of this community will be worshiping God through their tithes and offerings, and let that be your tithe today. Let information about you and our ability to connect with you be a way that you can worship God with us this morning. For those of you who are a part of us, I just want to remind you that next week is kind of a big deal. Uh, there are going to be a lot of people here that might never have been to First Baptist, might never have been to an Easter service, and maybe most importantly, might not know that Jesus is Lord of all things. And so I would love to remind you to make space for them. They will be in these pews. They will be around you. You have an opportunity, and dare I say a responsibility, to welcome them into this place so that they can hear the gospel maybe for the first time. It's Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is a very strange day, isn't it? Because just like the crowds gathered at the gates of Jerusalem and welcomed a king, that's what we're doing today, right? We are welcoming Jesus into our midst, and yet Scripture soberly reminds us that the same crowd that welcomed him into Jerusalem is the crowd that yelled to crucify him a week later. And so we gather with our expectations of what the king should do, what he should be like, what, what would be reasonable for kings to be, and in a week's time we are ultimately corrected when we worship the lamb who was slain. I love how the children sang that for us. 
how the instruments cut out, right? And the choir cut out and the children led us in, in, a, in a declaration of who God is. That's what Easter is about. Can I pray for us as we continue worship? Father, we acknowledge that there are all sorts of hopes that we bring to this moment. Just like those who gathered at the gates, we've heard that you can heal people. We've heard that you can change people's lives. We've heard hard teachings that you've given us. Lord, we know that you love the poor and we, you love the downtrodden and the marginalized. We know that you can love us, um, even as we are, even as sinners. And yet we are not quite sure what you will ask of us in a week's time. We're not always positive what bearing a cross will look like. But you have given us such an example in your son. You've, taught, you've told us that the love of God looks like a cross. And so I pray that you would be lifted high today in our songs. Lord, that you would be revealed in the way that your scripture is proclaimed and taught. We pray in small groups all over the building and in the worship service on Monday, Thursday this week, in all of these spaces, that you would be enthroned as our one true king. We love you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
One of the last lines in that choral song was, Glory to the Lamb who gave us life beyond the grave. But to do that, he had to love us all the way to the cross. Let's all stand together as we sing about that wonderful cross.
Thank you. You may be seated. I love the songs that we get to sing around Easter, and I'm particularly grateful for the leadership of our children's choir this morning. Can we express another word of gratitude to those children who led us this morning in worship? Some of my favorite memories of church were when I was a child on Palm Sunday. What joy it is to gather together in this season of the life of the church as we begin our celebration of Easter. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week, sometimes referred to as Passion Week, and it begins with Palm Sunday. To remember this moment in Scripture, let me start our time by reading to you from John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, as it recounts Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. It says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and said on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been done, which were written about him, that these things had been done to him. This morning, we are celebrating Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It was said long ago about Jesus in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 through the prophet that Jesus, the eternal king, the true king for the people of God, would enter into the city of Jerusalem riding upon a donkey's colt. As the people of God are gathering in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and they witness Jesus riding in upon a donkey, the words of the prophet Zechariah would begin to rise from the pages of the scripture. The people of God, as they witness Jesus, not riding in on the back of a horse like other kings as a sign of strength, but riding in on the back of a donkey's colt, would recognize that the peace of God was coming to dwell amongst men. No doubt they recognized that this was a prophetic moment being fulfilled in their midst. For thousands of years they have anticipated the arrival of their coming king. And as Jesus comes, they utter to themselves, this is what we have been waiting for. The people gather on the streets carrying palm branches and flowers and they begin to lay them at Jesus' feet so heavily that not even a single footprint of the colt touched the pavement beyond the foliage. And they shout to Jesus, Hosanna, save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. But as Reed alluded to at the beginning of our service, not everyone in the city will shout Hosanna. There are some, particularly the religious leaders, the chief priests in particular, who will not be shouting Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel, who but will be shouting crucify. We have no king but Caesar. We are on a journey to celebrating the resurrection of Christ Jesus. But we cannot come to the celebration of Jesus' resurrection until we come to the cross. For the last several weeks, we have been walking through John's Gospel, chapters 18 and 19, in which we are heading to John chapter 20, at which we will celebrate the resurrection gathering next Sunday. But first, we have to come to the cross. 
This morning, I want to invite you to return with me to John's Gospel, chapter 19, where we are going to resume our text together, beginning in verse 16 this morning. If you'd like to use the Pew Bible right there in front of you, John's Gospel, chapter 19, will begin on page 1072. And we are going to find the moment after Pilate has handed Jesus over to the soldiers to be crucified. We are going to join Jesus on this journey towards the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ has come to symbolize amongst us a symbol of abundant life. But truth be told, the cross really symbolizes one of the most cruel forms of execution within world history. But in the redemptive work of God, we find that the cross is this paradox. While in one way, when we look at the cross, we see the greatest evil of man in crucifying the Son of God, we also see this incredible expression of God's love by giving His Son for the sacrifice of our sins. We need the cross. The cross is necessary for our salvation. The cross is essential to our faith. We cannot gloss over the cross. We cannot pass by the cross. If the gospel is to be proclaimed, then the cross must be foretold because apart from the death of Christ Jesus, there is no reconciliation with God. We need the cross. And this morning, as we continue in John chapter 19, we are following Jesus as he journeys to the cross. There is one more encounter before us with Pilate and Jesus. And I would like you to resume our text of Scripture in John chapter 19, picking right back up in verse 16. God's Word says, So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. From the steps of Pilate's palace, from the seat of judgment that had pronounced Jesus to crucifixion, it is a little over a half a mile from palace's steps unto the place of the skull where Jesus will be crucified. Jesus is paraded through the city. He is given the main cross beam of his cross to carry upon his shoulders, and he is marched through the city towards this hill. Continuing one step after another, the crowd begins to mock him and insult him. The cross weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 to 100 pounds. And Jesus is so worn down at this point due to the beating and the flogging that Luke's gospel tells us Jesus can't even make it to the cross. A man named Simon is chosen from the crowd to pick up the cross and finish the journey as they march towards the hill of crucifixion. Jesus is led up to a hill that is known as the place of the skull. It's also known as Golgotha in our text. Church historians tell us that this hill received its name from the topography. That is, that as the hill rose out of the ground, it looked like the image of a skull. Sometimes we refer to it as Mount Calvary. We have that name simply from our King James translation. But whatever name we refer to this place, this is the location where Jesus will die. Verse 18 says it quite simply, once he had arrived at this place, there they crucified him. And although it's a very short moment in scripture, let us rest assured that it is a significant moment in Jesus' life and in our faith. It was no small moment for Jesus. Once he arrives to the hill with the cross beam, he would be forced to lay down upon the ground atop the cross. They would take his hands and they would stretch them out just slightly above his head where his elbows would be bent and his shoulders would be rolled back so his chest was pushed forward. 
They didn't merely nail his hands to the cross, but taking a six-inch spike, they drove it through his flesh into the hard wood that sat behind him. And then taking one foot and stacking it atop another, they would drive another stake straight through both feet into the cross. And as Jesus lay there in agony, they would raise the cross to its position and await his death. With a full weight of Jesus' body straining upon his hands and his feet, he is given the difficult choice of putting pressure on his feet or pulling up on the nails in his hands. Either way, it's excruciating. But scientists tell us that death by crucifixion is not only very painful, but it's also very slow, because as the individual hangs upon the cross, they are tilted forward, and as their body strains under the weight, their lungs begin to fill with fluid. They're labored in breathing, hanging in agony and ridicule, and this is how Jesus will die. From the cross, Jesus will actually utter seven words. He'll actually look down hanging from the cross and he will speak seven phrases to the people that are gathered below. And while I won't go through the seven words of Jesus while he's hanging upon the cross this morning, I do want to encourage you that on Thursday... When we gather for our Monday, Thursday service and we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we will walk through the seven last words of Jesus. The seven last things that he chose to say and speak to the people while straining under the weight of the cross. And by taking whatever breath he could, he spoke these seven phrases. It has been said amongst our congregation that our Monday, Thursday service is perhaps the most moving service of our entire church year. And so let me encourage you, be here if you're in town. Join us as we take a moment and prepare our hearts for the celebration of Christmas. It says to us quite plainly in chapter or verse 18 that they crucified him and there were two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Continue to read with me in verse 19 as we find our friend Pilate. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest of the law protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. It was a custom under Roman crucifixion that the governor who had sentenced the individual to death would prepare a notice. He would prepare a placard, and upon that placard would be the individual's name, their title, if they were given one, and the crime that they had committed. Crucifixion was meant to be punitive to the individual who would die, but it was also meant to be a public display of Rome's power and of their authority. And so Jesus is given this placard bearing his name and bearing his title. And if you consider this placard and what Pilate has written, it is quite remarkable. Because what we find written on this placard carries the weight of the full Roman Empire. The Roman governor, with his own royal pen, has written these words. He has penned this notice, and he has placed it above Jesus' head. With the full authority of Rome, and under the full influence of the law, no one dared take this placard down from above Jesus' head that has been placed upon the cross. Pilate has said of Jesus, That here is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He has written it in three languages. He has written it in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. Aramaic is the language of the people. It is the common language. It is the language that would have been spoken on a daily basis. 
There are portions of our Bible that are originally recorded in Aramaic. Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire. Any Roman laws or orders for the Roman military were given in Latin. Greek was the universal language of the world at the time. It was the language of commerce. G, uh, Pilate has written this notice about Jesus in all three languages. And his intent in doing so is that so that every person that passes by, whether they are from the city of Jerusalem, whether they are a foreigner traveling to participate in the Passover celebration, or whether they are someone simply passing by, every single person would be able to read at least one of the languages that Pilate has written Jesus' notice that is hanging upon the cross. Pilate has penned these incredibly powerful words. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. There are two things I want you to note about this notice that Pilate has written. The first thing that we must understand of what Pilate has written is that this is, official, this is an official proclamation of Pilate's innocence. This is an official proclamation of Pilate's innocence. Of Pilate's innocence. Jesus' innocence, forgive me. Pilate's position about Jesus has been made known quite clear to this point. You may recall with me that in numerous occasions, in both chapter 18 and in chapter 19, Pilate has said of Jesus more often than not that he is not guilty. Pilate has said of Jesus that Pilate finds no crime against him. Pilate has brought Jesus into his palace and he has questioned him more than once. And at the conclusion of the questioning, Pilate has settled the fact that Jesus is innocent. Pilate, in his statement that he is hanging above Jesus' head, is proclaiming his innocence. If you look at this notice, it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This is his name and his title, and there is no criminal offense. Not only did Pilate acknowledge Jesus' innocence, but the two men that are hanging on Jesus' right and on his left also will proclaim Jesus' innocence. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53 said that Jesus would be numbered among the transgressors. And in Luke chapter 23, we know that the two men hanging next to Jesus are considered criminals. And while they are hanging upon the cross, there is a dialogue that is unfolding between these three. And I want you to listen to the dialogue that is unfolding between the three as they're hanging upon the cross. In Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 39, it says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Pilate has declared Jesus' innocence. The criminals hanging on the right and the left are continuing to declare Jesus' innocence. And so this begs the question, then why is Jesus being crucified? Why is Jesus finding himself hanging upon the cross for crimes at which he did not commit? The Apostle Peter will say of Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2 that the reason that Jesus is hanging upon the cross is for this. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Make no mistake, friends, that Jesus is hanging on the cross not for crimes that he committed, but he's hanging on the cross for your sins. What has put Jesus upon the cross is not his crime, but what has put Jesus upon the cross is your sin. 
As the Apostle Peter has said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. And why has he done it? He has done it because God's love for you is so great. He has done it because God's love and mercy is so great that God himself has been willing to make the sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. The Apostle Peter says on in verse 24 that he himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Jesus has died upon the cross not only for our forgiveness, but he has died upon the cross so that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness. Friends, it is time for you and I to die to our sins. It is time for you and I to put our sinful ways behind us because when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, he gave us the freedom from the power of sin. And the words of John the Baptist in which he said, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. I say unto you, it is time to die from your sins. One of my favorite stories about Christmas comes, Christmas, my goodness, I am fumbling. One of my favorite stories about Easter, let me remember my holidays here. One of my favorite stories about Easter comes from a church in which they were doing a children's program in which the children were telling the story of Easter. There was a young boy who was given the responsibility of memorizing Luke chapter 24, verse 6, which says, He is not here, he has risen. And although the choir had practiced, although the children had rehearsed and prepared, when the moment came for the young boy to deliver his memory verse, he froze. Standing in front of the congregation that day, you could not recall a single word of his memory verse. And so graciously and lovingly, the choir director got up and whispered Luke 24, verse 6 in the boy's ear. And with a smile on his face, the young boy stepped up, grabbed the microphone, and said, He is not here. He is in prison. <laughs> so close, but not quite right. You know, many of us recognize that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And many of us recognize that when he was raised from the dead, he was victorious over the power of sin and death. But many of us are still living like we're imprisoned by sin. Many of us are still behaving like we are in bondage to sin. But when Jesus died upon the cross, he broke the chains of sin and he opened the doors of the prison that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness. Friends, it is time to die to your sins. I don't have to stand up here and give you a long list of what sins we should die to, but I pray that by, by the power of the Holy Spirit that God would make it known to you what you should leave here today. When Jesus died upon the cross, he bore your sins on his body, and there is no reason for you to take it home with you today. This Easter can be a turning point in your life at which you leave behind your old self and you take a hold the forgiveness and the freedom that Jesus Christ has given you by being willing to die upon the cross. Hebrews has said to us that we should let loose of the sins that so easily entangle us and we should run with great freedom the life that Christ has given us. Friends, leave your sins at the foot of the cross. Leave them there, for he bore them in his body, that you might live for righteousness. We have wasted too much of our lives. Too much time has passed by in which we have given ourselves over to sin. Let us leave them at the foot of the cross. For when Pilate penned this notice above Jesus' head, he declared his innocence and he proclaimed our freedom. But there's another thing that Pilate has done in this notice. Not only has he declared Jesus' innocence, but he has also publicly recognized Jesus as the king. Pilate has publicly proclaimed that Jesus is exactly who the scriptures testify to him being. Go back and look at this exchange with Pilate and the chief priest at the time. 
In John's Gospel, chapter 19, picking right back up in verse 19, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign from the place where Jesus was crucified, was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest of the Jews protested to Pilate. Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. First and foremost, this is a proclamation of Jesus' innocence, but second, it is also recognition that Jesus is the king of the Jews. This is incredibly significant because perhaps the most powerful government in the history of the world is solidifying Jesus' place in history as king of the Jews. And although the chief priest would dispute it, and although he would rather Pilate not say it, Pilate has written what he has written, and he has proclaimed for all of human history that Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus is who the scriptures proclaim him to be, that he is in fact the king of the Jews. And not a single person who would disagree dare touch the notice that Pilate has placed above his head, for it bears the full weight of the Roman Empire. We must see of this moment, though, that this is the chief priest and some of the Jews' final moment of rejecting Jesus. It was said of Jesus in John's Gospel in chapter 1, When John is giving a summary of Jesus' redemptive work, it says in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Pilate is stating a fact, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And although the religious leaders and the chief priests may dispute it, the very government that crucified him proclaimed it. When man sentenced Jesus unto death, it solidified his place in human history as the king. You may call that irony, but I call it divine intervention. What man meant to do to harm, what man meant to do to stop the will and the work of God to redeem all of creation, God saw to it that not only would Jesus raise to new life, but everyone would know that Jesus is the King of the Jews. Everyone would know that Jesus is King. That is perhaps the meaning of Palm Sunday. That perhaps is the purpose of Palm Sunday. For Palm Sunday is meant to testify to the fact that Jesus is king. Zechariah the prophet said that you will know Jesus is king when he rides into the city of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt. And when Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem triumphantly upon the back of a donkey's colt, he fulfills the prophetic word that Jesus is king. And when Pilate nails him to the cross, he puts a notice above his head proclaiming Jesus is king. Let me ask you, are you numbered among the Jews that day who threw their palm branches and threw the foliages at Jesus' feet and said, Hosanna, blessed is he who is the king? Are you among the chief priests and the others who shout crucify? We have no king but Caesar. Don and Olivia are going to come back up, and I'm going to ask them to lead us in a time of invitation. And for many of us in the room, we're numbered among those who would say Jesus is king. And if that's you today, I would encourage you in this next song to give thanks to God for your salvation, to worship God in response to the word and say, Jesus is king of my life. But you may be here today, and today for you is a day at which you want to proclaim Jesus king of your life. 
Myself and others will be down here at the front. And let me encourage you, if you are here today and you want to receive Jesus as your king for the first time, we want you to come. We want you to step out from your pew right where you are, come down one of these aisles, and let us celebrate with you as a church as we proclaim together that Jesus is our king. I'm going to ask that we would all stand together. And as Don and Olivia lead us in this time of worship, let us all respond to God as he leads in our hearts. And you come if the Lord leads. Brother Don. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sin. to continue our worship this morning through our tithes and through our offerings. I want to invite a portion of our ushers and deacons to come forward at this time to help receive our offering. And as they do so, let me lead us through a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the cross of Jesus, for what it symbolizes in our life, but most importantly, Father, for what it has made possible. 
Father, you have not only forgiven us of our sins, but you have given us freedom. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his willingness to go upon the cross, and thank you for the mercy and the grace that you have shown to each and every one of us. Father, with grateful hearts today, we give back to you a portion of which you have entrusted to our care. For we recognize, Father, that there is only one king, and his name is Jesus. We ask all these things in his name we pray. Amen. Deborah. We're going to conclude our service this morning a little bit different. I'm going to ask Jesse McCain, our director of missions, to come forward at this time. We have a mission team that is going uh, from our congregation out this week and will actually be apart from us during Easter. And Jesse is leading that team. And so I've asked him to come and just share a brief word about the team and specifically how we can pray for them. And then we want to pray and commission them as we close our service together this morning. So Jesse, tell us a little bit about our team. Thank you, Robert. Uh, first off, let's first figure out who the team is. It's a small team, but uh, a team that I'm very much grateful for. Justin, if you'll stand. Justin actually helps out with the ESL classes here in our building. Uh, so he and his wife, Kristen, are both leading that with For the Nations DC. And they're one of our community partners who I'm deeply grateful for. Uh, but also Alice Ling is a member here in our church. And she is also a part of this team. Uh, we are partnering with Lynn's Baptist Church. And so if you were to ask me, why are we doing this trip? There are two reasons, two reasons that we engage missionally. One is our personal engagement. We do it here. We do it um, outside of this area and to the ends of the earth. And that is that we have interactions, engagements. You might even call them relationships with people. And we seek to invest and to develop relationships with people so that we might speak the good news of who Jesus, uh, who Jesus is and what he has done for us, that we might tell them the good news of the gospel. 
But when we're talking about missions, there's a second way, I think, in which we should view and understand missions, and that is partnership. That is joining together with other believers, supporting them in the work they're doing there within their context. We have a clear example of this within the scriptures with Paul. Whether he's raising support for the church in Jerusalem or whether he's traveling to encourage, affirm, to teach, and to share. And that is why we are going to Lens Baptist Church. I have already admitted that my German is uh, non-existent. <laughs> Alice has been working on hers a little bit. But we are going to support Lynn's Baptist Church, the Streckers and believers there in Lynn's who are working in that area. We are there to encourage, to affirm, to stir them on, to share and to speak of what we've seen and heard, to speak of the good news of the gospel, but to partner together with other believers. If I can offer you a prayer prompt for this trip, I would ask that it be this. Pray for Lynn's Baptist Church that they would have rest. Lynn's Baptist Church is a sacrificial church. Internally, they have navigated the tearing down of their building, which required a permit, another permit to rebuild, and a bank loan. And all of that was finalized within this last year. If any church can be sympathetic to a building renovation, or should I say a tearing down of a building, I think it can be us. But not just that. It's not just the building renovation. Their church is 50% refugees and immigrants, and they walk hand in hand with them and help them navigate life in a different setting. Uh, often these refugees and immigrants come out of the Middle East. Third, they're bivocational. Their pastor is a teacher. Um, let's see, Jeffrey, if you remember Jeffrey, because they were here in 2022, Jeffrey works in uh, providing assistance and relief to those with special needs. Noah is a carpenter. These are people who give sacrificially. These are the words of Jesus out of Matthew 11. Out of speaking to some opposition, not unlike what we've heard this morning from Robert, Jesus offers this to those who hear and see, to those who are responding to God. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Pray that Lynn's Baptist Church would find rest and comfort and solace in their God, and that we would be able to seek God well together our time with them over Easter Sunday. Thank you. We're going to close by praying for this team. We're so grateful for their willingness to go and spend their Easter uh, apart from us, but we know that they will have a great worship time as well as gathering with the church. We're going to close with a prayer of benediction, and so I want to invite you to stand together. And if you're standing next to one of these who is going, let me encourage you to perhaps lay a hand on them, and let's commission them out as we too go out into the world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for these who are going. Father, for we are sending them on our behalf to continue to do the work of your kingdom around the world. Father, thank you for the truth of Christ Jesus, and we pray that you would continue to strengthen your church through the power of the gospel. May we always have a mindset as a church that we are not defeated, but we are victorious. For what Christ has done for us, Father, gives us the victory over this life and over death. And so, Father, we pray for this team, pray that you would give them safe passage, and we pray that you would use them, Father, in a way that strengthens and furthers your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for our morning of worship. Hope, we pray, Father, and hope that it has brought you glory and honor amongst us and throughout our community. We ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it.